Hi, everyone, and welcome to Raise the Vibe with Liz. This is Liz Peterson, and today I have Elaine Kosmeskis joining me today, who is a medium. I just finished reading her book, Seance 101, and I had to reach out to her because she is just a plethora of information on mediumship. And everybody knows how much I love mediumship. I'm super excited to have her join me today, and I'm hoping you enjoy her too. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Elaine, from astrology to ghosts among us to speaking with those gone before through mediumship and in our dreams, a spiritualist medium certified by the National Association of Spiritualist Churches, Elaine was born with the gift of clairvoyance and mediumship. During her over 30 years of mediumship, she has conducted many well-publicized seances, including the 1970, 1997 official yeah. seance. In 2004, she wrote Soul, Cy Soul Cycles, 2005 Connecticut Ghosts, and in 2007, Seance 101, which explores physical mediumship. And in 2010, her biography, The Making of a Medium. Her book, The Art of Mediumship, is a how-to book on clairvoyance, psychic investigation, and channeling. Dream Zone will teach you how to interpret dreams as well as communicate with the other side of life. The medium who baffled Houdini um, explores the life of great physical medium Marjorie Crandon and many, many more. We're going to be talking about her book, Exploring Physical Mediumship, which I'm just starting to learn about, and I'm ready to dive in. Elaine, welcome to the show. Oh, I'm very glad to be here. Thank you for having me, Liz. Yeah, so excited about this topic. Uh, my medium, my mediumistic abilities have been coming on. I was born with a, with a child as a child, but turned that down because I didn't appreciate seeing them, but I could still feel them. And that continued on into my adult life. And now it's coming back on and shifting. So I'm very curious about this conversation. I know my audience will be too. They're very curious. So let's jump into what was that like for you growing up with these gifts, Elaine? Well, first of all, I thought everyone was psychic. So I really didn't think too much about it until I got to be about eight. And uh, uh, I was in my... Mrs. McGinty's classroom in Boston, Massachusetts, Dorchester, which was an Irish Catholic section of Boston. And uh, we had 42 students in that class. And when she talked, you could hear a pin drop in the room. Everyone was very, very respectful. And she uh, decided to show us what um, hand lotion looked like under a microscope. So she put a drop of ink lotion under the microscope and we all lined up. And we all got a few seconds to look in. And of course, hand lotion is primarily lateral, so you see pink bubbles. Well, I heard my Hindu guide say, that's your birthday present. And then I thought, well, my, my birthday was yesterday, Sunday. I, I don't think I'm getting any more presents. And I said, am I going to get a microscope? I'm going to get a hand lotion? And he said, no, that's your present. What you see is your present. And when I came home, my Irish grandmother, who was very clairvoyant, just had to be this box embossed with pink puzzles. Uh, pink bubbles and she said the same thing my guide said here's your present and I said oh my goodness and I opened it up and the aunt and uncle who couldn't make the party stopped by to give me a bracelet but I realized that I was the only one that heard that in the room and that I was seeing things clairvoyantly and I've learned from that when I see something to give what you see because there's a reason why you're seeing it and it's so easy to want to interpret it and say oh it's going to be a microscope it's going to be a no this is what you're going to see. This is what you're going to get. And I always loved my Hindu guide. I love talking with him and sharing things with him. Unfortunately, my grandma, who was from Ireland, she grew up in uh, County Galway, was very clairvoyant also. And so I had that support in the house. We didn't talk about it all the time, but she knew I was seeing things. And she said, Elaine, never be afraid of the spirits. It's the people who are alive you need to be afraid of. And I always remember that. It really gave me great comfort. And uh, like you, when I got into uh, puberty, I really didn't want to see them anymore. I just wanted to be a normal kid. And by that time, I figured out other people were seeing them. So I realized I was different. So they did go away for a while. And when I was in college and I was 18, I was taking a shower. And I got out of the shower and I looked up and there was my Hindu guy back again. And also he told me more about the colors in my aura. He said they were emerald green and cobalt blue. 
And I wasn't so afraid by then. I wasn't really afraid, but I wasn't, I was more interested, shall we say, because I had read a book about Edgar Casey, who also saw auras and communicated with guides. And I realized I wasn't mentally unbalanced, that there were other people who did this and it was normal. And Casey, I love because he read the Bible through every year. He was a Christian, I was brought up Christian. And he was a very good person. So I think that gave me the faith to, to communicate once again. And then uh, when I was finished college, I used to love to go to see other mediums work. And there was a woman who lived in the uh, Boston area. Her name was Reverend Conroy, Gertrude Conroy. And she was a crack medium. She was so good. People would come from everywhere to hear her give messages. And uh, she always used to say to the ladies, now don't you be going to see Mr. Filene's and Mr. George, which are the major department stores in Boston. You come here first, you come to church first. And she said to me one day, she says, Elaine, I see Connecticut over your head. And I said, well, Reverend Car Carmel, I'm not even sure where Connecticut is. I was being fresh, but I'm Boston was my whole life. Why would I ever leave Boston? And yet a year, uh, about a year and a half later, I did marry uh, my husband, Ron Kismestis, and we did move to Connecticut. And I do like Connecticut now, but it was, that's how it is. She just saw Connecticut over my head and she just gave me what she saw and it was true. Uh, and she was a delightful lady. She helped so, so many people. So seeing her work and her devotion to those who were less fortunate gave me the courage to go on. And I was fortunate that I was uh, in Etna, Maine or in the Maine area. And I was reading a newspaper, was with a friend, and a little, at the back of that, don't ask me why, but I have this habit of right, um, reading the paper sometimes from the back forward. I guess it might have been Chinese and other like, I don't know, but I do that occasionally. And the, the Bangor Gazette, and this little ad about two inches by four inches said the first spiritualist camp up at the main was going to open that afternoon at 2 p.m. So you know how when... Every hair on your arm goes up and you just know you have to do something. And so I said to my friend, I said, do you mind if we go? I'd really like to see this camp. He said, sure. So we went and I saw this lady, little short lady, about my age now. And I was probably about 22. And I said to her, do you know any good mediums? And I said, well, if you want an honest reading and an honest reading. I hadn't really thought there was such a thing as a dishonest reading. She said, if you want an honest reading, go see Reverend Bill Ellis. And she pointed uh, his cottage out. And then I thought, I started to walk away. And I thought, how does she know he's an honest medium? I went back and I said, how do you know he's honest? And she just very slowly smiled. And she said, I'm Mrs. Ellis. And that was my first reading. And he was a great medium for, the, uh, for $5. He gave me this wonderful reading. He read my aura, told me about my grandmother. Now, I'm 5'3", but he saw this taller woman next to me. Grandma was about five seven, and he described her hair and what she looked like, and she'd been dead for twelve years by then, and so I was really quite impressed by this. I said, "Wow!" And then he also told me some things about myself nobody else really knew, because I by that time I really kept my mouth quiet about being psychic. And he told me all about that, and he said one thing that I'll never forget. He said, "Elaine, someday you're going to be doing this work." Now I had just gotten my certificate to teach English from. Um, University of Massachusetts in Boston. So I had no plans on being a medium. I was going to be an English teacher. So I kind of did say anything. I just said, oh, okay. And he said, Elaine, you know, I know you don't mean, you don't believe me. He was very honest. He was a great guy. And I said, well, who knows? And he said, you are, if the spirits say you are. And uh, about eight years later, I was the head medium at another camp in uh, Maine, Camp Temple Heights. And who walks in but Reverend Ellis to join our spiritualist circle? And I told her the story. We both just laughed and laughed because that's how spirit where we are in life. Um, the camp. And it said that in Brookline, Massachusetts, there was a husband and wife they did a psychic development group, a mediumship group. And at the time, lo and behold, I was living in Brookline, Massachusetts, about five miles from where they were going to do their spiritual circle. Uh, so I went every Friday night for three years. And then eventually I took the test and became a medium. The test is not too bad. It's a, it's a written test. But the second part of the test is an oral test. You have to go to a church where you're not a member. And the mediums 
and the congr and the congregation, the board of directors, uh, will rate your mediumship. So you have to do a demonstration for several people. And then afterwards, they will ask these people if, in fact, you were correct, that you did identify the spirits correctly. And uh, if you do, I think you'd get your certificate. So it was very interesting. I think the National Association of Spiritual Churches do a tremendous job of training mediums. They really do. Because it's a religion, and they want everything to be to be copacetic, to be well-trained. And I met the most wonderful people from spiritualism, wonderful mediums, and uh, people very dedicated to service, to, be, uh, to teaching our first principle of spiritualism, that there is no death and there are no death. I think that's a very important thing. And um, it's... It's just it's been a, a wonderful joy, a great adventure for me. But I really never thought, I was thinking about being a writer, but I got busy, I had four children, I got busy with carpools and things. And when my youngest was in high school, I decided, you know, if I'm gonna write, I either have to start now or never. So you ladies out there, there's always time, once the children get in school full time, to do your writing or your creative work and go ahead with it. You'd be surprised. And, um, my first book actually was an astrology book, Soul Cycles, because I was teaching astrology. I'm a professional astrologer as well. And my poor students, I never saw their faces. They were always copiously taking notes. So I said, if I do anything, I'm going to put all these notes into a book. And that was Soul Cycles Astrology 101. And I put so much in it. It's over 500 pages because I thought, this is so much work. I don't think I'll ever write a book again. Did you feel that way when you wrote your book? No, I it was a lot of started getting hits for another book. And I want to back up what you said, Elaine, like if people are trying or getting the intuition to write a book, do it. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Like and once you get going, it's like ideas come, you know? And yes. I, I truly believe that uh, we don't have enough good literature on the subject of mediumship and, and astrology and psychic development. I mean, there is, there is some good books out there, but we need a lot more. We really do. Yeah, and your books are great. I recommend them. Um, I also want to say, like, I really appreciate the Spiritualist Church, too, and really wish that I had one in my area because I love, like, all of the information, the way they approach community, and the training that comes along with Very good training. and mediums. Yeah. 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 I loved what you said earlier that your grandmother said, you know, spirit um, the spirit and the people. There are way more bad people out there than there are bad spirits. And I agree. Oh, absolutely. Yes. And she she was very good. She was um, just a natural psychic. She never took any classes, but people knew she was like that. The Irish like to read cards, regular playing cards, not tarot cards. And sometimes just as a favor for a family member, she would read cards. And my Uncle John was going out with my aunt, oh, they were just dating. And he, and he was living with his mother, grandma. And uh, he bought her all these presents and they were wrapped in his room. So Polly came over. She said, oh, I hear you read cards, uh, Mrs. Burkett. Would you read my cards? And so she said, of course, dear. So she put the cards out and she said, I, I see a beautiful pair of black leather gloves. You're going to have a great Christmas. And a pink scarf, too. And then she said, oh, my goodness, and a beautiful ring. And my uncle was beside himself. He thought that she'd gone in and I'd wrap the presents and peeked. And my grandmother said, no, I would never do that. She was just awful. She just didn't need to be so active, but she was. And she had a great sense of humor, too. Yeah. That's so great. over and over again, she would see the spirits. She would talk to them. But in those days, ladies really didn't work outside the home. And I think she, she just was happy helping people as, as they asked for help. Oh, that's beautiful. And gifts, psychic gifts, mediumistic gifts, they run in families, right? They tend to. Yes, they do. They tend to. But I mean, if somebody in your family isn't mediumistic, that doesn't mean you can't develop it to a certain degree. For those and most, curious, a lot of mediums are born with it too. Yeah, for those I have curious a theory about, about development, what would you mm -hmm. recommend to people who have mediumistic abilities or they think they might have it or... Um, they're wanting to develop that so they can communicate with their deceased loved ones. Well, uh, first of all, I would recommend you do some reading because knowledge is power. And um, I love the Edgar Casey books are very good on spiritual development. A lot of the spiritualists have written books. And if you're interested, I have the Art of Mediumship, which is a book that I wrote for my students 
who've been in my class for many years, but all these books will give you at least some basis. And the second thing I would recommend is try to find a spiritual development group. It doesn't have to be the spiritualist church, but a group of like-minded people that take the subject seriously. And if you're fortunate to get a veteran medium, so much the better, but sit at a regular time. Um, because, you know, spirit expects us to do our our part. So if you sit like the Gladys Customs would sit every, we'd sit Friday nights from seven to nine. And my teacher, Reverend Gladys Customs was a trance medium. So she would uh, go into trance and give us our lessons in trance. Her guide, the professor who was a Hindu would come through and tell us wonderful things and explain things. And then we'd all have a snack and then we'd come in and it was all direct experience, the second part. The whole room would just fill up with lights and fragrances and people would hear voices and they would uh, see uh, spirits around and we had to identify them. She said, well, it's going to feel like you have a helmet over your head and you're going to feel maybe a little lightheaded, but take a deep breath and just give what you receive. That was her rule. If you receive something, you should give it out. And she says, if you hold it in, you're going to the end of the, of the session, you're going to forget it. So we all gave things out and shared. And we had some wonderful people in the group. We had a rabbi. We had two MIT professors. Don't tell me the government doesn't know about psychic development. They know all about it. They have for years. And um, we also had um, school teachers, secretaries, housewives. Uh, we were in Boston had medical people, insurance people. We had wonderful people in the group. And we were all so close. I think we you believe in reincarnation. Gladys said one year she told us that she had a group that everybody had been together in ancient Egypt. And we all just had this camaraderie. It was beautiful and very supportive of one another. And there was, I really never felt competition. I felt everyone was helping everyone else. And one of our, uh, the MIT professors, and I, I will never give his name, I don't plan to, but he was a professor at MIT. He, in the 1940s, he had said, you know, that someday we're going to go to the moon. And his colleague said, you're ridiculous. That's not going to ever happen. And he got so upset. He, How did it since he says, yes, in 25 years, we're going to be there. And exactly 25 years later, uh, one of the astronauts came to MIT to thank the professors who had helped them and brought a, a box of uh, rocks from the moon and gave it to him. Just like you said. So, you know, interesting. That's fine. He wasn't particularly psychic, but when he got mad, he was psychic. <laughs> and I think it was his wife more that was interested in it than he was. He was very good. <laughs> That's fantastic. What are the differences in the different styles of mediumship? Uh, it depends on the individual, I would say. Uh, my strongest gift is clairvoyance. But when I write, I use a lot of telepathy because telepathy is uh, easier and quicker to communicate. Uh, if you're a healer, I mean, spirit may work with your hands. If you're an artist, you may be working with your hands. If you're a musician, a, <clears throat> a lot of mediums work clairsentiently, which is fine. They just see the spirit in their mind and they feel good about that, which is good. Um, some mediums, prefer uh, to work directly in trance, where they go into a trance-like state. And when they're in the trance-like state, their guides either overshadow them or come through directly. But that you have to really train a long time for that because you want to be sure you're in good health. And when you're in trance, your body slows down. Your heart rate slows down. Um, your vocal cords change. I do trance meetings too, but I, I a wonderful trans mediumship in my teacher Gladys Customs, and I also knew Elwood Babbitt, who was a great trans medium too. Uh, he wrote his biography is Voices in Spirit. And I can tell you, when they went into trance, they were not the person that I knew when they were talking to me before they went into trance. Gladys was, you know, an older woman. She was very proper. She had been a professional harpist. Everything was done exactly stage ready when she did anything. She called, she was doing a mediumship demonstration. She called the minister and asked what the minister was wearing. So they were coordinated color wise. And uh, she had everything, she was magnetic. 
So her personality, when she went into trance and the professor came through, was a Hindu with a different accent and talked about things that Gladys would probably have never known in her waking state. It was totally different. And Alwood Babbitt, the same thing. Uh, he wrote a, a book, was called Talks with Christ. And he actually, he didn't channel Jesus, but he channeled the Christ force. And it was such a high vibration that he was, he got the first time, first time he tried to do it a few times, he got so sick, he was in bed for two weeks. So his guide said, well, we know what we're going to do. We're going to have Dr. Fisher, which was his main guide, an intermediary between you and the Christ force, so you don't get so burnt out from it. But it was, you know, you could tell when someone's in trance, they're in deep trance, they're, they're cold vibration. And I, I bet if you took their blood pressure and temperature and, and uh, voice print, it would be totally different. So it's interesting. So trance is one way to work. Uh, clairvoyance, seeing the spirit, hearing the spirit, clairaudience, working through your hands with art, music, or healing is another one. And uh, well, just recently, the last 20 years, I've been studying physical mediumship. And physical mediumship takes even longer to develop. You have to be a full trance medium, and you have to be able to have the right chemistry to create the atmosphere for physical mediumship. I think there's only about 10 really great physical mediums that are alive today. And I had the privilege of uh, being able to be in about six of them, six or seven of them, their seances. And they're amazing, amazing workers. Uh, all have very different personalities, different guides that come through. And sometimes, you know, you always want to check things out, the uh, person that's rational. I went to a seance with uh, a medium by the name of Warren Kaler. And uh, he has a guide called Lady Donna that comes through. And she talked to me and uh, gave me a message. Well, about a year later, I went to a Gary Mannion seance. He's an English medium. And Lady Nada came through and gave me the same message. So I mean, that to me wow. is evidence that that is the same person coming through, which is interesting. I bet Gary. My, my latest book is about that. Exploring Physical Mediumship is the last book I wrote. Yes, and you had many, many stories in Seance 101 about physical mediumship and different types of mediumship and way more than about seances. Um, if the, people are interested in that. Book. Seance 101 is actually a spirit card. Do you have some it, examples but... of um, physical mediumship that you could share with our audience? Sure. This is the cover. Can you see it? See how beautiful that cover is? Yes, it is. It's well, cool. that cover has Arthur Ford, the media, Jesus, and a butterfly. And uh, it was actually a spirit card that was precipitated by uh, a very well-known Camp Chesterfield medium, Reverend Hoyt Robinette. And he sat for, I think, 19 years to develop this gift of precipitation. Uh, and the spirit cards that come through, that, that you put blank cards in a cobra box. A cobra bo uh, box has uh, lined with cotton so the cobras can't see out. You can use it for spirit cards because it's like a development box. Nothing comes in, no light comes in. And I got to know him quite by accident. There was a medium that was serving the church, Reverend Gail Hicks, and she told me about Hoyt. And uh, it was actually at Reverend Kenneth Huston's funeral memorial service that I met her. And she went on and on about the spirit cards. I didn't quite understand what she was saying, which was good, because if I understood, I would never go to the seance. It was, that's ridiculous. But first of all, I couldn't understand what she was saying. So I said, oh, okay, Gail, I'd like to see him. So I drove, we drove uh, seven of us, my husband, myself, and five of the students, we drove into um, the Cape, into uh, the area. And we, I came early. I was, I was determined to see what this was all about. So we came about a half hour early. And Hoyt was so gracious. He knew I was checking him out. He knew. He just had a smile when he saw me get into the front seats. I had all the students sit in the front seat, too. I said, we're going to really watch him carefully. And he came to be like, I think, the second person. And the person he gave me was my, um, he, before he does the spirit cards, he does a billet sales. And the person he gave me was my grandmother, Catherine. Well, mine was like this. I didn't move a muscle because Catherine's a very common name, let me tell you. And I was not going to raise my hand. And so he goes, oh, he goes, Catherine, nobody rec recognizes you. Who's with you? 
that's hairy. So I raised that. That's my grandparents. <laughs> he was so, he was very, I had to admit, they were my And um, then uh, he actually, on the spirit card, I saw my grandmother's name written in, and some of the names of people that he could, there was no way he could have known who they were. So it was very evidential. So the second seance, I often have communication from Reverend Arthur Ford. So, so I'm going to test them again. But I, I'm not going to be fooled by this guy. I want to know. So I said to my spirits, I said to, uh, if Arthur Ford is my guy, I'd like to see his name on the card. So on the back of the card, there were several names. The very last name that was printed in very, it was in green. You could read it. But you could tell it was the last one was Arthur Ford. And it had a little red heart next to it. So I thought I tested him. And uh, I've had maybe 20, 25 seances with him. And we always have a wonderful experience. And he's so humbled and these wonderful gifts to be humble and truly trying to serve spirit. So um, if you ever have an opportunity to go to a spirit card stance with Reverend Hoyt or Hoffman, it's certainly worth the worth your while. So yeah, I've enjoyed that. But amazing. publishers love the picture so much they put it on the front cover, which is cool. Yeah, I thought that was cool too. What are other things that people can manifest through during physical mediumship? Well, I, I will start with what I consider the easiest is table tipping. I really, I do. If you get a group of people together, you start singing and you're sincere, you're going to get the table at least moving a little bit. And the more you practice, you're going to get it to actually begin to, uh, I, I always suggest a three-legged table. And as it goes up and down, you can get an alphabet going. Like A, like one thump is A, two thumps is B, three is um, C, etc. And it will actually uh, answer questions. I have a lot of fun with the students when we do it. Uh, yes or no, you have to ask, ask yes or no questions. Like you might ask, is um, Joe Biden our president? And if it goes to the right, it's yes. If it goes to the left, it's no. Whatever you want to set up as a code. And ask some very simple questions. And then once you, you feel you're getting good answers, then you could ask other questions as well. Uh, we had fun. I did a... a uh, program on physical medium to Lily a couple of years ago. And for some reason, they had the Christmas lights around the altar still up. They weren't on, but they were, they were still on around there. So we were doing our table tipping. The table started moving around. If it had enough electricity, got the lights going on and off as well. So it was very interesting. Very... Oh, that's really that's a good way to start. I also like psychic photography. A lot of people that aren't psychic at all can do spirit photography. Uh, if they take your time, um, and there are lots of books that have been written about it, but basically it's uh, getting in touch with the spirits, you know, being alert to the energy. And as you're working with them, you should always um, ask for spirits' permission to take their permission, uh, take their picture, just like you would ask for anyone's permission. Uh, that's that's another one that I think is uh, people can master. And the third one, let's see. I guess I would say transfiguration, but that takes a little more time because you have to go into deeper sides of state of trance. The other first two, you don't have to be in trance. Transfiguration is when you are sitting either in a spirit cabinet or in a darkened room, and the spirits actually begin to build up ectoplasm, and the ectoplasm goes over your face, so you wouldn't see the medium space. It begins to take on the features of spirit, but that does take a little longer. Um, Wow, that's well, those are great things, yeah, that you can work on. Uh, other people have done other aspects of mediumship. And the whole thing to remember is this physical mediumship to be a calling card to help people want to develop more spiritual gifts and more spirituality. Wow, the, the Bible is absolutely filled with demonstrations of uh, uh, psychic phenomena. Really, it is. it can be very spiritual. The writing on the wall in Daniel, the party of the Red Sea, Materialization of the Lows and Finishes by Jesus. Those are all physical medium stories. And uh, healing, when Jesus helped heal the person that was blind. I don't remember the story, but the man had been blind since birth. And Jesus went down and he got some mud on each side part of his hands. And he put over the man's eyes and then he washed it in the clear water. And he could see for the first time. And of course, they were always trying to trick Jesus. Always. So they said, whose fault is it that he's blind? And he was very wise. He said, neither. It was it was made so so the will of God could be manifest. But 
he knew that the man, there were some karmic things that were going on. He didn't say so. But there are a lot of beautiful stories of physical phenomena um, in the Bible. So I do feel it can be spiritual. I really do. I'm not a big fan of the Ouija board. Have you ever used the Ouija board, Liz? I have. And I found that I didn't know who I was communicating with. And I swear in when I was 19 in college, my roommate and I actually opened a portal in my bedroom. So I think that if what, you know, if, and when you do use the spirit board to just have consciousness around it and, you know, like attracts like, and if you have fear, it's probably not the best tool to use. Is that no. Well, yeah. The reason I don't use it the spiritualist churches don't allow me to uh, be tested with a, a Ouija board or crystal ball. But I also feel it's dangerous because it's like opening your front door and say, anyone come in? You might get yeah. some good people. You might get some mysterious spirits. So I, I don't recommend it. But I'm curious about the crystal ball. Why do they not want to test mediums with a crystal ball? The because you're supposed to, have, uh, excuse me, you're supposed to have your clairvoyance develop so you don't need a crystal. I, I don't, I'm not against them, by the way. I think crystal balls can be fine. In fact, uh, when I did the uh, um, Houdini seance in 1997, I was very reluctant to do it because I, I didn't want to be involved in something that was going to be uh, kind of a sideshow or whatever. So when they invited me, I said, well, I'd like to think about it. I'll call you back in a week. And I was just about to say, no, it's not for me, but I'll be glad to check around for other mediums that might want to do it. And I was going out to lunch with my husband, so I went up to comb my hair. And I and you know, the uh, crystal ball or a mirror is like a portal. So I was just going, and Arthur Ford appeared. And he said, he said, Houdini has a message for you. He says, oh, I guess I'm going to have to do it. But but it was just, it was that, that mirror that really brought him through. So uh, crystal balls, mirrors uh, can really bring spirit through. Um, so I'm not against it, but I, as I say, I, I'm more negative on the Ouija board because you get communication that can be garbled or confused. But you know, that said, people have had good experiences. Jane Roberts uh, was writing a book on how to develop ESP and she had very good success with the Ouija board right from the beginning. She got name, the name of someone that lived in her town in Elmira. She got his address and his where he worked. And if you have somebody's address, you can get the property records and check it out. And she did. So that got, was a big boost for her. Yeah, that is amazing. And I she later became like a trans medium. Bringing spirit through with the crystal ball. I always thought the crystal ball was for gazing in order, because I use eye gazing to trigger my clairvoyance sometimes. It's fine. And the Hindus use it. A lot of cultures use it. Yeah. Yeah. And mirrors I a, also, I've read a lot about mirrors and actually sitting, um, in a closed space with a mirror off to the side so you're not seeing yourself in the mirror, but bearing, being able to bring spirit through that way as well. Right, like Dr. Raymond Moody's Psychomantia. That's a wonderful thing to do, really. It's great. I want I to did, get I, hear a few more stories. I have to tell you my story of my crystal <laughs> ball. My husband bought me one as a gift because he, he thought it would be nice. So I had the crystal ball. And I at the time, my kids were having a big trampoline in the backyard. So I put the crystal ball, if you, should, if you do use them, please cleanse them. Because I've been in the store, who knows who's been touching them, are using them worse yet for voodoo or whatever. So please cleanse it. You can cleanse it by using a quarter cup of, of sea salt and water and spraying it over the crystal ball and saying this ball, this is to be a blessing to humanity or it cleanses for, for good. But I decided to do a method that they uh, put it under the full moon. So I took the crystal ball, put it on the trampoline, which was about oh, 15 feet from my office in the backyard. And I very carefully put towels all around it so it wouldn't roll off. And uh, it was a full moon. So I got up in the morning, went in the backyard, and guess what? It was missing. And my heart just, who would take my crystal ball? And so... I just said, this is ridiculous. I looked at it and there was a path about 15 feet from where the trampoline was all the way to my office window. I think that was spirit. I wow. really think this. You don't need this crystal ball. Just stay going with the office. But I, you know, you find these little demonstrations come to you. 
<laughs> That's great. I also see Safia Sai Baba on your bookshelf behind you. And there's yes, a picture yeah. of him in the back yeah. of Seance 101. And he showed up for me in spirit in 2019 in my room. It was really, I was like, wow, okay. Safia Sai Baba is just standing here. <laughs> and well, you know, it's I've wonderful. been working he with did. him. Yeah. So um, what has been your experience with Satya Sai Baba? Because he's also, I mean, can be thought of as having that physical mediumship gift. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, uh, many years ago, how did they get into Sai Baba? Oh, I was doing a class at uh, Asnanta Community College. And what I looked you on um, parapsychology, and I used to invite a hypnotist who was, um, voice painting was very well known to come and do a class on past life regression. So he did a wonderful past life course and uh, everybody processed. And at the very end, boy said, well, you know, there's this Hindu avatar in India. And it said, if you write a letter to him and he takes your letter, you will get your request granted. So of course, all the students, about 30 that were taking down the address. And so I asked one of them who took short in to give, if she'd please give me the address next week. So I went home and I thought, what if this guy's a fake? I've just given all my students an address of a fake girl. That's a terrible thing to do. So I went to uh, the public library and sure enough, there was a book on Sai Baba. It was by Howard Burford, Man of Miracles. And inside it said it had been donated by a group in Windsor. Now I live in Subfield, Connecticut and Windsor's about 10 miles away. So I said, oh, I'm gonna call them and, and talk to them. And I did. And they couldn't have been nicer. It was Edna and Art Yule. They were the most wonderful couple. They were both engineers retired. And they said, well, Lane, we'd be happy to talk to you. Why don't you come over and join us? I would be delighted. So we, we got a date together. I joined them for coffee. And uh, they talked about Sai Baba. And uh, they gave me some vimuti, vibhuti. And I was on my way to work with a, to do a healing for a woman who was in the hospital. And I mentioned, just mentioned it. And so I said, oh, I've got a shawl for you. I want you to give it to her. It was blessed by Swami. And I just was really liked them as people. So I said, well, I think I'm going to invite them to my home and invite the students to join us. Because I felt it was a little, really getting into religious, religious aspects of the college would maybe be offensive to some students. But I really didn't want to do that. But the end of uh, the class, uh, of course, in parapsychology, I said, well, in about a week, we're going to have a speaker on Sai Baba, and I'd like to invite everyone to join us. And they came, they showed us a movie and a video, and they took questions. And I said, this is so fascinating. I started going to the center. And I am a better person for having known Sai Baba, because his motto is love all, serve all, and very big on service, helping people who are um, have food insecurity and need some housing and things like that. And finally, I decided I have to go to India to see him. And I did. So in the uh, video on Sai Baba, he makes Bavuti. And he goes like this with his hand. And there it is. Oh, I said, I just don't know how he does it. I mean, I really, I was trying to figure it out. And so when I was in India, and one day I got, I was in the first row, which is about maybe two feet from Sai Baba. And he came to me and he looked right at me. And instead of going like this, he put his hand out like this so I could see it. And I saw the babuti bubble up from the palm of his hand. And there was no tricks. There was no way you could possibly wow. have anything. I mean, right there, there was his palm and there it went up. And then he gave it to the woman next to me who needed some healing. And I said, oh, he knew I was, I was doubting him. He knew, it. but I felt okay. And you know, you have to test people. You have to be rational. I had wonderful experiences with meditation and uh, enjoying uh, spiritual people. I think uh, there are people from all over the world that came. A lot of people came for healing because they had uh, ailments that could not be treated medically. So it was a good experience. I went to see him three times, and each time I think I came away a better person. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us, but many of the groups continue to promote his teachings. And one of the things I liked about the Sai Baba group, they said that you didn't have to change your religion, that whatever religion you were born in was fine. So he said he wasn't here to start a new religion. So he's done a lot of good. And That's India good. seems to have so many wonderful gurus. One of the first person that I really enjoyed that was a Hindu was Paramahansa Yogananda. Uh, and I read his book, Autobiography of a Yogi. And I think I've read I've it studied with many, too. many times since. It's a great book. Yeah. 
And it's, it's one of the few project. books that's written by someone, yeah, in English. She wrote it in English. Yeah, they have it's a chapter important. here in Seattle. And I've uh, taken classes with them and gone to their program and taken the Raja Yoga meditation course with them too. Yeah, they're, they're wonderful meditators, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And yeah. I think they te try to keep the teachings as pure as possible. Yeah, they and do it. Nice. And they do, like say, this is not a religion. You know, they even have a picture of Jesus up on the altar saying, you know, all, all faith is welcome. And, you know, it's all part of the path. Everybody has their own journey, you know, to in spirituality. And they honor that. I think that's one. If, the, if we had that as a world model, we wouldn't be having all these horrible wars in Israel and Ukraine. People would see things differently. Yeah, I really think so, too. I really think so too, Elaine. Um, let's it's talk a little about, bit about your book. We're going to like, yes. like, sort of steer us off because I do want to keep us on the mediumship topic. So exploring yeah, this physical is the mediumship, that book, yeah. like you give exercises in this book. Can you share one with our audience? I think that would be fun. Sure. Well, this is the cover of the book. It's actually a picture that is, uh, you can see Dr. Shrek, Shrek Nazi. Yes. And Eva C, who is a medium. And she was tested in different laboratories, and um, he has wrote a book on clear on um, it has many many pictures of ectoplasm in it. He was a medical doctor, so I think he would know what was coming out of the human body, and he did a tremendous amount of research. Uh, but I like the picture because it's taken in a laboratory, and it does show the uh, the energy going from hand to hand. Uh, a lot of things. There's a lot of things that I like uh, in the book that are very helpful. I guess my favorite chapter is probably the one on psychic photography because I love psychic photography and encouraging people to to try it. And you know, you don't have to have a fancy camera. In fact, I recommend that you don't use a fancy camera because um, a fancy camera is going to have a lot of uh, filters in it. You don't want filters. Um, I think you know, a camera that's about ninety dollars, like I use a, a Canon Pixel can camera. Very simple camera, simple to operate. And when you get the pictures, take a moment to look around because many times you won't see the uh, see it with your naked eye, but when you see take the picture, you'll see it in the picture. So don't give up if you don't see anything. And I feel it's a very good idea to take three in the same spot because it does have three pictures of the same spot. Uh, look at the orbs. Sometimes orbs, be, orbs are very common. Just uh, Google orbs.com and you'll see hundreds of orb pictures. But as you get more developed, you'll begin to see the orbs form faces and the faces begin to have features. And it can be very helpful in that direction as well. Some people even get writing. There's a wonderful group uh, of the Go group in England. Have you heard of them, Liz? No, I haven't. Great. They um, uh, we just we're doing a class in Subfield on physical phenomena. We just finished their book, The Skull Experiment. But they have a little different take on psychic photography. They uh, um, they were four mediums. They met um at twelve weeks where they lived in the basement. They had a round table in chairs, and the spirits came through and gave them directions on how to do their version of psychic photography. And at one point they took unopened canister of Polaroid film, placed it in the center of the table during a seance. And they developed the film and they actually had writing on the film. They had writing wow. in footages, and they had pictures. They did incredible things. And um, I think it was their dedication. They were all veteran mediums. And they all wanted to see if they could do physical phenomena. And also the fact they did it regularly. But I, I think that's great. In the book, I have some of the pictures that from uh, William Hope. William Hope was a very well-known um, psychic photographer in Crew, England. And he had a group called the Crew Circle. Now, William Hope is not in Seance 101. So I did the research. I got so many negative reports about him. I said, I just can't put him in. It's just, I can't do it because there's too much negativity. But the spirit has a way of getting your attention. And I went to a uh, physical phenomena seance by a gentleman from England. And his uncle had been in the crew circle. 
So I asked him, I said, you know, did he ever know we hope? He said, yes. My uncle was in the crew circle. And I said, boy, you know, there's so many, he's so controversial. Some people say he was a pick and other people say he was genuine. He was absolutely genuine. He only, he was a carpenter. Billy Hope was a carpenter. He only took what his wages would be. So if he were $20 an hour working as a carpenter, he an hour of photography, that's all he took. He would accept no more. And the problem was that, you know, people who don't understand spirit photography look at it and they think it's double exposure. But he said it was absolutely genuine. And You can see it up here. You can see one here. You see that that is ectoplasm around wow. this person above, the, and that was uh, someone uh, who had died. And this was a Reverend Charles Lakewood Tweedale who wrote books on on psychic phenomena, and the spirit of his deceased father appeared. And I would hope a, a Reverend would be honest. And apparently, he was very well respected. And his wife is next to him. Um, and I was really glad, so glad that I was able to find a second source on it and somebody that actually knew about the crew circle firsthand. So that was good. And so he is in the second book. And I think that there's going to be more evidence coming to the spirit of photography. I really do think there will be more. Just book. I was, um, I like to do research. So a friend of mine, Sandra, said, Elaine, you ought to do some research over at the Danbury Music Hall. Every night about eight o'clock, the elevator rings for no reason. So we have a ghost. I said, okay. We, Danny's a good friend of mine. Went out to lunch. And then we, he was uh, like, she was in the chorus at the Danbury Music Hall. I said, okay. So that night, nothing happened. But I took a picture of um, a very famous woman. And as I took her picture, I got all these faces around it. And I really wasn't looking for that. I was looking for voices. But I was very happy I did. And I felt it was because Spirit was saying, well, we didn't give you a the voices, but we did give you her picture, and it was it was great. So Sunday Spirit will give you different things, and the way they came in, that just all this ectoplasm formed over her skirt, and in the skirt were these faces. She was, wow, that is amazing. So they never and know. You want to keep your mind pictures, open. Yeah, people want to see the pictures that Elaine held up to the screen. If you're listening on podcast platform, go ahead and head over to the YouTube channel and check it out there. See. Elaine, I've also um, dove into spirit photography, gotten great orbs. I lived in a house in Paulsville, Washington for 13 years and um, had a ghost there. I nicknamed him Bob and I was taking a picture nice. of my son one day and they were consecutive pictures and he was just sitting at the kitchen table. You know, it was Lovely. around the first day when he was younger, but one of the pictures came out. You can see the figure. It's a white figure and they're walking away. You can see like one arm ahead of the body and hey. the legs like separated. And then um, also a tour, I got a couple great shots on the tour of the uh, Seattle underground that they have out here and did consecutive shots as well and actually have a spirit face. You can see it prominently forward. And in the next picture, it's back a little bit and then, you know, back even farther. Yeah, it really helps if you take those consecutive shots, and it's really fun. It does. Let me show you the most famous spirit. I don't know how long you're going to see it, but this is her Abraham Lincoln's widow, Mary Todd Lincoln. Wow. And the spirit of, I should tell you a little bit of the backstory. Mary Todd Lincoln um, suffered probably from what we call bipolar, but she wasn't diagnosed in her day. And she had these terrible rages and moon swings. And the poor woman got only worse because she lost her son, Willie, in the White House and really put her in deep depression. So after her husband died, she constantly sought the comfort of mediums. In fact, even while Abraham Lincoln was in the White House, a dedicated medium by the name of uh, Nettie Coburn, and she later became Nettie Coburn Maynard, gave seances. So after Lincoln's death, she went to see a Boston medium by the name of William Mumbler. And... He didn't know who she was. She wore a very heavy veil and she called herself Mrs. Tyrell. So he didn't know it was Mrs. Lincoln. And when he went to snap the picture, he said, well, could you remove your veil so I could see your face? And he snapped the picture and Abraham Lincoln stepped in. I think that shows the great devotion. And it was a beautiful, you could see it all over the internet. It's a beautiful, beautiful wow. picture. Now, it, it, you realize that that is evidence for the woman and gave her a great deal of comfort. Lincoln actually, uh, 
while he wasn't a member of the spiritualist church, he actually believed in uh, the spirits. He did. Um, and it's nice to have book, that uh, connection so we can still communicate with our deceased loved ones on the other side. Oh, you know, I, I wrote a book, Connecticut, the uh, Golden Age of Spiritualism, that I had to do research on Betty Colburn Maynard. I was really surprised. She not only was she a great trans medium, but when uh, Lincoln was going to um, talk about the Emancipation Proclamation, he wasn't going like, to issue it right away because he felt it would make more make it diff more difficult. And the spirit of Daniel Webster came through in a seance and told him that he must immediately publish it, that it was going to be his, his best work, the most beloved piece of legislation he did. So you'd be surprised. Uh, this, so, I, so many books on about George Washington having spiritual experiences and Abraham Lincoln, and even um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt invited Dean Dixon to the White House. She was a very famous, and she did use a clairvoyant. Uh, yeah, I've heard the stories did. of the White House, that they've had some activity in the White House. I've heard that as well. For those people who yeah, are, to keep it. are reluctant to believe in physical mediumship, can it be proven? Have Absolutely. there been scientific that's studies? All, that's the whole point. Yeah, well, they're doing a lot in uh, Europe on it, Germany and Switzerland. Yeah, I mean, even uh, in the case of Eva C, that was like 1906. They were doing studies. Dr. Richet in France, he's very interesting. The Institute of Metaphysics, he actually had a medium by the name of Frank Klusky, K L U S I, who could materialize spirits to the point where they would put their hands in wax. And the wax would hard and then spirits would remove their materialized hands. And you can see those on the internet. I mean, that that is pretty physical evidence. Yeah, and some days it'd be children's hands, and there were no children in the seance room. Or the hands would be clutched like this. Well, you try to get an impression like that. You can't. They were very unused. So that was right at the turn of the century that happened. Um, and there've been Russia's done a lot of research. It's an older book, but psychic discoveries behind the iron curtain. They talk about a man by the name of Friedrich uh, Jurgensen, who recorded uh, Voices of the Dead, and there's been lots of books about that. So, so it's been it's been researched. Uh, Dr. Gary Schwartz in Arizona, he had Susie Smith, who's a well-known author, and uh, help him, and he uh, tested several mediums, including a woman that I, uh, I'm very fond on, Reverend, very fond of, Reverend Ann Gaiman. She is a Lilydale medium, excellent medium. And she was part of the test. And she was like, I think she was like 90% correct. And yeah. the person could only give yes or no answers. You know, So he, he actually did quite a lot. Um, and the afterlife studies talk about that. And I think the evidence is overwhelming that a person can, who's trained now and has the ability, can communicate. And sometimes people will come and I'll do readings for them. And they may be people who don't lost contact with their relatives. And I always give a, a CD of the reading to the person. And we'll come back a year to say, oh, I checked it out. My great, great grandmother's name was Ella or whatever. So they do the research, which makes it very evident. We try to be evidential because we want people to know that not only are the spirits there, but they can help you and they have names and, and give their identity as well. And this afterlife it's, a little harder. it's it's nice for the families. And Absolutely. you know, if you have a physical medium who can bring through a guide or bring through your loved one, it's very helpful in the healing process. Let's talk about that afterlife communication and relationship to, you know, bringing forth, you know, our loved ones or using our spirit guides to bring forth our loved ones or messages for us, you know, as we're grieving and healing. Absolutely. I, I think that's the, uh, the first thing that's very important for spirituals is to prove the continuity of life. And the second is to help the grieving and to help people who are grieving. So that's a, a very important to minister to them. It, it's very difficult when you lose someone you love. Um, the only thing that makes it more bearable is to know they're no longer suffering, that they're in a better place or they're, they're out of their bodies. Um, Although it still is very difficult to accept the death of a young person uh, because it just seems unnatural. We do try to bring through uh, messages from people who passed over, 
frequently they get upset. They don't want, if it's a child, they don't want their parents to grieve because they say it makes them sad too. Um, and sometimes it may be that all they can say is they're in no pain. I was, a few years back, I was asked to do a reading for a um, woman in Canada who had lost her uh, contact with her son who was a medical student. He'd taken a year off to go hiking. And they absolutely don't, didn't know where he was. And they were beside themselves. They were, he was in a foreign country, I think South America. And I, uh, I felt, I did remote viewing and I got as far as leaving the hostel and going down the trail. And then the person I was reading for said, no, I don't think he ever left. So I said, well, I guess I don't have it. But uh, about six months later, I was having an acupuncture treatment of all things. And I guess he still wanted to communicate with his mother. And I, I opened my eyes and there he was standing right there. And I said, oh my goodness. I said, can I tell your mother that you're all right? I said, oh, can I tell your mother that you're at peace? He goes, no. He says, just tell her I'm in no pain. Because he he had only been in spirit six months and he was going through a lot of processing also. So I brought that message to her. Um, the only thing he told me was that he had died from a fall. So I don't know if he was pushed or it was a natural fall, but he said he had died from a fall. So, so I think you get closure. At least you know the person is no longer with us instead of, she was constantly looking for him and I don't blame her. Yes. Um, nice but, for people to have answers. I find that if people can have some sort of answer that there can be resolved and some just, even if it's just a little bit of closure around the death But that process. was rather or unusual. If they were alive or dead or like not knowing. Yeah. Because I'd let it go. I just felt I wasn't, I wasn't on his vibration. I just, but I don't think he was ready to come to him. Maybe it took him six months to really, on the other side, to reach the point where he wanted to communicate to. If you lose someone, it's good to wait a while before you see a medium because they're adjusting also. I've done readings where they'll wheel the, the grandmother in a wheelchair. Well, she doesn't need a wheelchair, but she thinks she still does. You know, So it takes a while for them to realize that they have all their faculties and abilities. So it's... It is good. I I do think the higher form of mediumship is communicating with guides, as the guides are more evolved than we are, and they help us to grow. And um, some of my favorite literature is the channel to spirit guides. Alice Bailey's work with the Tibetan, um, Madame Blavatsky, Helena Blavatsky's uh, work also with her guide Katumi and Amoya. Some wonderful wisdom has come through. And my my friend Elwood Babbitt's books. He brought through incredible. Uh, I like if you like medical mediumship. He wrote a book called Perfect Health, except no substitute. And spirit doctors came through and gave advice, including Doctor uh, Wilhelm Wright, who's a very famous uh, psychiatrist and medical doctor. You have advice on how to meet our spirit guides. There's a chapter in the book, but I would say that the problem there are several ways you can contact your spirit guide. One is the first way, the way I did as a child, which is seeing them clairvoyantly. Another way is pe often people see their spirit guides in dreams. So if you write your dreams down, that could be helpful. Yeah, my and the most, Yeah, and the most common way is through meditation. Um, you don't have to meditate in a cave. You don't have to meditate for hours on a time. You could do like a five or 10 minute meditation. And if it's practiced on a uh, regular basis, the spirit guides do like to come through. They may come through as a face, a picture, a message. And another way they love to come through is signs. You know, many times, like if you uh, find a feather or a penny, you find a penny, look at the date. It might have a meaning. You never know. Or why or why the feather came through. You might have a Native American guy. So they love to come in. I think the uh, spirit guides have evolved beyond the earth plane, and they come back as teachers. But they're, they're serious. If you are not serious in your meditation, they're not going to be coming through as much as you would want. Even the Native Americans, they do, um, they make pr uh, prayer flags. You take a red square, you put a little bit of tobacco, and you say a prayer. And then you make, make 10 or 12 of them. Well, there's a very precise way of doing it. And, you know, you're told you have to do it this way because they want you to take this process seriously. And Vinny Nar, who's a wonderful shaman, I went to one of his healing ceremonies and I brought my, I put a video up 
Dr. Neil Rapolsky told us what video to watch. And we went out, my husband and I went out, we got the, the red cotton and we got the tobacco. And we it took us about a couple hours, but we made those prayer, prayer flags a certain way. And when we went to bidding our seance, uh, he's, he's German, but he he was so taken by Native Americans that he actually came over to the United States and became a shaman. Well, you then you could hear the Native Americans coming in, they shake rattles and and people felt a wonderful presence. But the most interesting thing, it was just after Halloween and they put these little uh, bowls of candy, like with Kit Kats and Hershey's, little candy bars. I said to my husband, if you have me a Kit Kat afterwards. And what happened during the science of spirit children came through and all the candies were thrown all over the place too. It was a <laughs> the purpose of the seance was to bring your prayers and to pray for other people and to pray for world peace, of course, and to realize the Native Americans have wonderful shamanic rituals for that because they do contact their spirit guides through meditation and sweat lodges and purification. Yeah. So that's one way too. And Christian meditation is wonderful too. If you could give our listeners one jewel of wisdom to carry with them. You know, after hearing your interview, Elaine, what would that be? Well, I think it would be the 11th commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. That to me is sums it all up. We're here to be light bearers, to help people, to share what we can share, to be compassionate. And I think the 11th commandment is what I try to live my life by. And I would suggest others use it as meditation. I love that, Elaine. Thank you so much. How can people reach you and work with you and find out all they can about you? Absolutely. Thank you for asking. I have a website at www.thetartofmediumship.com. And I, I do have a Zoom. I'm going to be doing psychic dreams on Zoom for six weeks for people that would like to take that class. And I also have a media section. If you, I, when I do a lot, this will be posted. And if I do other lectures or videos, I post them there for people to watch. And every month I post the uh, new moon and the full moon. If you're into astrology, you can learn a little bit about where the moon is each month and a little bit of what to expect in general. So uh, I hope people look at the website and I, I enjoy hearing from people also. Great. Thanks, Elaine. I appreciate that. And that's theartofmediumship.com, everybody, to find Elaine. Elaine, it's been such a pleasure to host you. Thank you so much for joining me on Raise the Bye with Liz. Thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed your questions, and I love your enthusiasm, Liz. I hope you get another book. Too. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for reading my book. I really appreciate I that. And I, I, love I enjoyed it. I can't wait to read a couple more. Yeah, I love them. And I love your storytelling in the books is really fun. So everybody go out and buy Elaine's books. They're fantastic. Check out her website, The Art of Mediumship. And then you can find me on social media and my website, raisethevibewithliz.com. Thank you for joining me, everybody. And remember to get out there and raise the vibe. Have a great day, everybody. Bye now.